Hi, dear friends, cultural creatives, and seekers everywhere. I'm Bruce Lipton, cell biologist and author of the best-selling books, The Biology of Belief, Spontaneous Evolution, and The Honeymoon Effect. Well, I have a very interesting story of a life experience that started when I was seven years old and in second grade. The first time I looked into a microscope and saw cells, amoeba, paramecia, algae, and I saw these cells through the microscope as this little kid, and I saw a world that was existing that I couldn't even see. And in that world, these cells were like little people moving around, and it, it got my interest up. And the relevance about that is that 20 years later, I graduate from the University of Virginia's graduate school with a PhD in cell biology and electron microscopy, studying cells. Well, it all paid off. In 1967, I had an opportunity to work on stem cells, when in the world there were only just a handful of people that even knew what stem cells were. And the significance of this research it revealed something entirely different than what I was programmed to understand as a biologist. In my education, I was programmed to see that life was controlled by genes and that life was just a temporary existence. You're born, you live, you die. And I lived with that and actually taught that kind of biology to students, including medical students. However, in 1967, my research on stem cells revealed a completely different story. It revealed that the environment was actually controlling the genes, that the genes were not turning on and off and regulating life as I had been telling students. But the fact was, it was the environment that was selecting genetic activity. And I go, well, what was relevant? And I say, what I was teaching students was essentially victimization, meaning as far as we know, they didn't pick the genes they came with, they couldn't change the genes if they didn't like their characteristics, and we tell the students that genes turn on and off and express their activity without us being involved. Well, if you understand that story, it's basically a story of victimization. Genes control me, and I don't control my genes. But in the experiments in 1967 on stem cells, a whole new insight to biology was given to me by the action of the cells in my culture dish. And what it revealed very simply was is that genes are controlled by information from the environment. And in regard to humans, not only that, but by the perceptions we have of that environment. And you say, so what? And I go, well, here's what's so important. If genes control my life, then I'm a victim. But if perceptions and environment control my life, then I have the option to becoming a master because I'm the one that controls my perceptions and my environment, and therefore, I am the master of my genetic activity. Well, following that interesting sideline, which led to a whole new field called epigenetics, is the fact that cells and tissue culture are controlled by the signals from the environment through what is called the cell membrane, the skin of the cell. And when I was studying the nature of how that cell membrane translated environmental signals into genetic activity, I recognized one very important fact, that obviously no two people are biologically the same. I say, well, what do you mean? I say, if I take my cells or organs out of my body and put it into your body, your immune system will reject that transplant because your immune system can recognize that my cells were not your cells. I say, well, then there's identity to cells. I said, yes, uh, you cannot transfer your cells or receive cells from somebody else because the immune system can read whose cells they are. And I go, well, where in the cell is that personal identity to be found? Well, my research again led to the cell membrane, and on the surface of that cell membrane, there are receptors, and receptors are devices that read environmental signals. If, for example, in your human body, the parallel understanding is you have receptors to read the environment, and where are they? Well, they're located as developments of the skin. Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch, pain, temperature. I say, what's relevant? I say that these signals that the cells receive are coming through receptors that are analogous to our own receptor organs. And I say, yeah, but what's unique? And I said, no two people have the same set of what scientists refer to as self-receptors, receivers of self. I go, well, what does that mean? I say that each of us has an identity based on a set of proteins built into the cell membrane, like antennas, like tiny television antennas sticking from the surface of your cell. But no two people have the same set of these antennas. 
And I started to realize a very important thing. Yes, self receptors receive a signal called self. But what was most important in this insight is that the self receptors are on the outside of the cell. I say, so what's relevant? I said, well, whatever the signals that identify self are not coming from inside the cell, they're coming from the environment. When I understood that the signals of self were coming from the outside and entering into my body, I started to also recognize the important role of quantum physics, which is based on what? That the idea that we have a physical reality and an energetic reality, two realms of the universe, is an error. In quantum physics, there's only one realm to the universe. Everything is energy. And all of a sudden, I started to put this together and I realized something that profoundly changed my life, that our identities are not in the cells. Our identities are sent to the cells as an energy broadcast. And I go, well, why is that relevant? And the answer is best understood in an analogy. And that analogy is this. Consider my body as a television set and that the antennas on my cells are downloading a program called The Bruce Show. And I go, well, why is that relevant? And I say, well, look, go back to an understanding. You're watching TV, you're watching a show, and the TV breaks, and I say, ah, oh, the TV is dead. But the most important question now is, did the broadcast die with the TV? And the answer is no. The broadcast is always there. And then it hit me, oh my goodness. Our identity is not within this body. Our identity is an energy field received by this body. If the bodies come and go, it doesn't alter the existence of the energy field. Our identity is immortal. It's an energy frequency out in the field that's always here. And I say, what's the relevance? Well, if this television called Bruce dies, the broadcast is still here. And if an embryo in the future comes up with the same set, of those antennas called self-receptors, I'm back online again with a new TV set. Does it make a difference if this TV set is male or female? No, nope, it's the TV set. Does it make a difference if this TV set is black, brown, yellow, red, white? No, nope, that's the TV set. To distinguish us from who we are, we're not the TV, we're the broadcast. And all of a sudden, the concept of our immortality became so real to me. And the understanding of ancient people's insights into what is called spirituality also came to an understanding for a very simple reason. In quantum physics, we talk about the energy in the field, that the energy is uh, like an aquarium of information surrounding us. We're enveloped in an information aquarium. The relevance is that ancient concept of spirituality are now supported by the modern concept of quantum physics. I go, well, what do you mean? I say, well, what do quantum physicists call the energy in which we're immersed? They call it the field. I said, what's the definition of the field? Invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. I go, wow. When I understood that, all of a sudden I said, oh my goodness, the ancient term spirituality represented what? invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. And then all of a sudden it hit me and said, oh my God, ancient spirituality wisdom is the same as the wisdom offered by quantum physics today, that we are creators of the world in which we live. Oh, I was so excited to give people an opportunity to recognize they're not victims of their genetics, but they're absolutely creators of their life experiences, including creating their genetic activity. And I wanted to tell people, and I started to give them that story. But unfortunately, at the very beginning, that story was given in terms of scientific vocabulary. And I go, why is that relevant? Because the vocabulary that we use in science is somewhat akin to the Latin used by the church. Meaning, if you're not part of that leadership, if you're not the priest or you're not the scientist, the vocabulary of science is obscure. No one really understands it. And I started to realize it was very difficult to translate my new insights about quantum physics, spirituality, immortality using conventional science. And that's when I started to realize, how could I best get this information to the public? And then all of a sudden I took up a new occupation. I became an actor, but what was the most exciting thing is I took that science and made entertainment out of it, a field of presentation called edutainment. I would dress up in costumes and then play around with the jokey stories to do what? 
to provide insights to people about the nature of this new science of spirituality. The reason why is when we really own that we're spiritual entities, then we start to really recognize we're not victims of the world around us, but we are truly the creators of the world around us. And so now uh, my life has been kind of overjoyed by playing an actor in many different roles. To demonstrate the consequence of edutainment, I hope you enjoy the following montage of excerpts from videos that I provided to the public. Hi, I'm a scientist. Hi, I'm a spiritualist. You know, we both act as truth providers for human civilization, except for the fact we are very different. I believe in and worship God. I use a scientific method to understand nature through experimentation and observation. What can science show you that God can't? Oh, oh, excuse me. You caught me in the middle of my creation moment. Yes, I was using the force to create an image of a world that I would love to live in. You know, we can all do that because we all have the force. There's only one problem in today's world though, and that is we've polarized the force. Holy yikes, the people of Earth are facing a mass extinction. They don't even know what to do to save themselves and their beautiful planet. I must go down there. I must go down there and help those people. Scotty, beam me down to the planet. Greetings, I am Dr. Beyond, and I welcome you to the multiverse. Oh, there's a nocebo alert on my Apple hologram machine. Oh, I must go help Alex. Dr. Nocebo is giving him a lot of negative thinking. And what Alex doesn't recognize is that negative thinking is equally powerful in changing our lives as positive thinking. And now let's go live to the cockpit and speak with astronaut Dr. Bruce Lipton. Bruce. Bruce. Bruce, can you hear me? I think we're experiencing Mr. Bananas, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to talk to the world about this special mission to save the planet. We have new information on... Hi, I'm Dr. Beyond. Welcome for this opportunity to look into the future. Gazing into this crystal ball, we can understand things that we haven't really come to understand in our world yet. I'm not sure what it is, Bill drives into the local gas station where he sees the mechanic. <gasps> There's a gas station! I'm gonna go in there! <laughs> Whew, wow, I'm lucky I made it into the garage before anything went wrong with the car. Well, Bill, what seems to be the problem here? Well, hi, Mr. John. I'm having a problem with the service engine light that's flashing. I don't know what to do about it. Well, there'll not be an easy fix. You go wait in the waiting room and I'll come and get you when the job is done. Thank you, Mr. John. My dad will be real happy to have the car fixed. Mr. Speaker, may I address the Congress? Yes, Mr. Lipton from Virginia. You may have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Hancock. Distinguished members of this Congress in the history of civilization, we are creating something brand new, something new that the world has never seen before. And what did I personally learn from my own educational experience? And that is simply this. Yes, heaven on earth is a reality. And to experience that every day when I wake up, the first thing I do is recognize how lucky I am to be on this planet. And then I start to recognize how love is the glue that holds everything together. So first thing I do when I wake up is say, Wow, I'm back. And then the next thing I do is tell my loving partner, Margaret, how much I love her. The significance of that, that is the fuel that carries me through the rest of my day. And love is the power of peace, harmony, and health.